Okay, welcome everybody. It looks like we've got a good group joining here. Um, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, this is the Multi-Cloud Networking as Code webinar in partnership with HashiCorp and Worldwide Technology. I'm going to hand it off to Derek to, to start things off. Thank you, Derek. Thanks, Dana. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna go ahead and uh, actually I'll have Mike. Mike Rockwell, do you wanna go ahead and uh, kind of kick it off here and then I'll do my introduction right after you. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, hey, good morning, everyone. I, I, I wanted to welcome you this morning. One of the things, Derek, can you put the agenda? Yeah, there we go. We put this together because our customers were hearing from them uh, by and large that that they're having challenges uh, with with cloud networking. Cloud networking is hard, and we're here today to go through a couple different uh, solutions that that will help with this. So the quick agenda is uh, Derek Monahan from our Cloud Solutions Group is going to go through kind of what what the problem is, what we're trying to solve. And, and then uh, Jake from HatchCorp is gonna go through how their, uh, how their software fits into the solution. We're gonna go back over to Dana. Dana's gonna do an excellent overview and demo of how it all works together. And, uh, and then kind of some resources that are available to you. And of course, Q&A, and, and we encourage you to please put your Q&A into the chat window as we go along and we'll answer them as appropriate, or we'll hit them at the very end. So we thank you for joining. And with that, Derek, take it away, please. Sure, thanks, thanks, Mike. So <clears throat> just wanna kind of kick it off real quick. My name is Derek Monahan. I'm a, I'm a technical solution architect at Worldwide Technology. My focus uh, is in the cloud networking and, and we define cloud networking kind of holistically across like, What's, how do we connect customers to the cloud? How do we connect between clouds? And, and obviously there's a lot of uh, just complexity within each, in each cloud provider alone. So we look at this holistically. And, um, my, my background, I'm, a, I'm just a network guy, you know, from, from uh, the start. You know, I've been doing networking for over 20 years. Um, I have, you know, a lot of experience in wireless mobility and I spent some time in collaboration. So along with that, you know, it gives me a holistic view of, of our customers, uh, you know, objectives and initiatives. So, so I just want to kick it off and talk, talk about, I did this a, a recently with Aviatrix on another webinar. And, it, you know, one of the things that I think um, Aviatrix does really well at is, Kind of going through there. There's a lot of. I know Dana has done this on his uh, his talks, and there's a lot of complexity in, in networking, and, and we'll we'll talk a little bit about some of that. I'm not going to repeat some of the things that Dana does, but I think that there are things that we see that um, a, we we want to always simplify our our customers' journey, and and we we have many different approaches to it. But these talking points are going to be around. You know, what do we see in the market? What are some of the trends that why are things getting so complex and, and how can we make it easier? At the end of the day, this is about, you know, leveraging this infrastructure as code, which is the key topic today, and then leveraging Terraform as, as a great example of how to, how to achieve that. So uh, when we look at this uh, large picture, we, you know, every customer I talk to has a multi-cloud, uh, you know, they're looking at multiple clouds. Now, this picture here is a pretty common story we see with our customers. And if you see right in the middle what what Aviatrix is doing is, is trying to tie and simplify this, this together across not just different cloud providers, but we have customers that are in Equinix today and they have on-prem locations. And now really it doesn't matter on-prem is now the edge is becoming a key part of that. And, and uh, AWS announced this week, in fact, you know, how the edge is evolving and, and 5G and other things are happening. So there's a lot of, a lot of complexity that's occurring in parallel. And, and what's important here is that you really need to think about a cloud networking strategy as part of your overall cloud strategy. And that's, that's what we see sometimes as an afterthought. And, and so it's really important to kind of look at that from a cloud networking perspective. And, and we have workshops and strategies that help, help uh, with our customer's journey. Um, at a high level, uh, from a business standpoint, I use a slide sometimes to talk to customers about what we see as common, uh, some new trends and, and what's the macro level trends and down to the specific use cases. And these use cases are just a, a handful of use cases. Um, I was just talking to a peer today about uh, content uh, network and delivery, you know, with, you know, real time media and, and video and streaming. And there's all kinds of use cases we could get into, but this is just a, a high level from a digital business perspective. We're seeing large customers expand globally, even within the US and, and they can't wait for the network. The applications are very 
you know, fast uh, in terms of migrating or even expanding. They have to make these applications on demand for, for new markets. Um, and use compute, we see this quite a bit in virtualization of the desktop and, and SaaS, of course, is a key theme. So, so as we move into even what container workloads and what, how many customers are, are looking at this uh, from, from a way, moving away from VMs into containers, you know, you have to think about the network and how it's going to apply to these different key use cases. And at the end of the day, it's, we look at it from a business outcome perspective. So a couple of use cases that I kind of touched on, energy compute and rapid global expansion. I'm not going to go too far into these, but you know, one of the things that we're, we're always trying to solve for is the, the optimal experience and network performance is at the end of the day, it's really about the, the end user, the end user's experience. It's about that customer satisfaction making that end user experience extremely fast and simple and easy. And um, they, you know, customers can no longer wait. Even, even corporate users can't wait for, an app to load a database to, to synchronize with the, you know, the application across the country. It has to be fast, it has to be seamless, and we have to think about that um, experience all the time. Reducing traffic hairpins you know, is something common that we see, and, and that's something that with Aviatrix's solution we see is, is really solving for that. You know, that's, that's one thing that it has an intelligent view of the network and, and how that uh, that contextual you know information is fed and learning the routes and propagating the routes automatically and uh, making it the right path and not having to you know that symmetry of traffic is so important so in energy computing that's that's key and also with rapid expansion you know whether it's a, a customer whose you know applications and networks need to be automated we're hearing that time and time again the, that's where I think you know Terraform and and Aviatrix come into play because the network has to be automated too and so. We we are going to talk today about some you know examples. I know um, Jake's going to talk about the Terraform uh, in detail, and then we'll we'll show an example of how we did our lab. But it's really important to uh, to be able to adapt with the applications and the environment. Also, data is living in multiple different locations Geogra geographically. We're seeing a much distributed customer base. So one of the key themes we're trying to help is how do we reduce latency and improve that user experience at the same time we're we're trying to meet legal and, and, and regulatory requirements so that security is is extremely important in in the cloud so we all tie this together and you can start seeing this complexity build up so where are these things challenging so we we, we actually there's a survey that was out and that 82 percent of organizations say that their ability to migrate apps to the cloud is actually hindered by the increased complexity of their network infrastructure and I, you know, that's that's something that we're always trying to address. We have a lot of our customers, it's not a single vendor, it's multiple vendors and multiple uh, different interfaces and different plat, you know, management uh, tools. And, and operationally, when we're looking at visibility, you know, we have, haven't have seen that really solve for until recently. And I think if you look at an example where Aviatrix pulls out the, the co-pilot is a great example, having that end-to-end -end visibility is, is gonna help it simplify that that whole observability um, initiative that our customers are, are trying to, to solve for, and that means looking across multiple clouds, looking across the you know the data centers, the clouds, the branches, and and how to have that end-to-end -end visibility uh, is really important now. So uh, at the, at the top here, though, whether it's a single or multi-cloud, that that security can be uh, very or that complexity can be very uh, complex even a single cloud we have we have some customers that have hundreds of vpcs in one cloud in one provider so when we think about the network it doesn't mean that multi cloud is the only challenging environment a single cloud can be challenging and we we think that that is important uh, use case where we can solve for if we look at some of the myths and misconceptions uh, we, we some of the, you might have heard some of these but uh, just kind of go over a couple of these. I mean, having having comments like you don't need visibility or troubleshooting, it's a service cloud providers will take care of it. Um, you know, obviously that's not true. We we always need to have visibility. In fact, the the there's a there's a new briefing we created around the modern observability and, and modern visibility of the network. And that's that's really important because some of the tools if we use our legacy tools today, they're not going to really solve and help with the new cloud paradigm of, of cloud networking. And it, it might help a little bit, but it's not, it's not the entire picture. So you, you definitely need a, a observability strategy and visibility will really simplify things, um, especially when you're trying to, to reduce the meantime to repair and, and obviously be proactive in line with the business. The business owners are expecting applications to run and it can't wait uh, too long for uh, someone to figure out where where the issue is. So um, we're also seeing 
you know, as far as some other things in here, the networking in cloud requires little expertise. It's just there and always available. And I've heard this before, and even by, by some of the cloud providers, it's, I, you know, I, I tend to disagree that it's, you know, it requires a little expertise. I mean, there, there's definitely, uh, you know, the complexity of the cloud changes all the time. If you look at just trying to keep up to date, you know, on our own, and we do a pretty good job of it, but it's, it's almost um, impossible to become an expert across multiple clouds and all these vendors. So how do we make that simpler and how do we make it easier for, you know, our customers to support it and manage it and look at it from a day two perspective. So, so from a uh, aviator's perspective, I'm not going to go through these, but there's really at, at the center here, there's, you know, this cloud strategy. This, this is also the part of the cloud networking strategy. And we look at the business strategy as the most important aspect. And, and then if we start in the bottom and, and work our way to the top, you know, a lot of customers are looking at short-term initiatives, short-term strategies, but the longer-term ones are the ones that are really key to, to enabling that business and that real true digital transformation and business transformation. And, and that uh, the, the, the area that we're going to focus on today is obviously infrastructure as code and automation. And, and um, one of the great examples I'll talk about here in a second is we build labs all the time. And we have a lot of labs our customers can access at no cost, just logging to our platform. And, and recently we just built a brand new Aviatrix lab that was essentially all through infrastructure code using Terraform. And so, you know, this is a strategic thing that we feel like is, is, is not just a nice to have, it's actually a, it's a, it's a requirement now. And, and for that reason, I'll kind of talk about our, our environments and our lab because this is, this is a, a picture of what we've built at our, at our, you know, on our platform today. This is actually a real drawing that's in, in production today. And we've built multiple pods that we spin up dynamically through Terraform. And because Aviatrix is a, officially a Terraform provider now, um, this, this really makes it easy to, uh, for any customer to, to build and, and manage. What we've done here, if you look at this picture here, especially the one at the top corner, we're not just building um, Aviatrix components with Terraform. I mean, we're using, we're building, you know, the gate, we're doing a lot of things, obviously automated um, from Terraform, but we're building out a full-blown AWS environment, a full-blown Azure environment. We're adding uh, Google Cloud. And, and in addition to that, we actually leverage Terraform to build and integrate with our Equinix uh, Colo. And what's really important there is we're able to spin up our a direct route, you know, an express route and direct connect uh, links to, to the, uh, to the ABX transit network in the middle there. And so this, this is a great example of how we leverage Terraform to automate this. And within literally under a little bit over an hour, we were able to bring up a full blown multi-cloud uh, hybrid. That means the connectivity to on-premise uh, in, in an architecture, you know, a little over an hour, that's pretty amazing. And if we look at some of the benefits here, we're also not looking at this from a pure greenfield perspective. This is really ideal, you know, that's great. We can, not every customer has an opportunity to build a greenfield, but we're actually integrating with a brownfield environment here too. And so that's an important point that we, the flexibility is there with, with the Terraform, um, especially the Aviatrix provider, we can, we can build and integrate with existing, uh, you know, brownfield environments. So, the benefits that I see, you know, are listed on the right. Um, one, it reduces complexity. You know, there's there's much much uh, uh, much more streamlined and less complexity involved in building out an infrastructure like this using the Terraform uh, environment. And and we also know that by doing this, we reduce risks and and also errors. And when we say that, if we think about the old school way of building a network out, there's a lot of errors. In fact, one of the major reasons we have outages in, in networking is because of manual errors and and so this this essentially reduces that and brings that risk down also and i think jake will talk about this and i think many of us know but the declarative i, I can't emphasize it enough is what what terraform really is about it's it's a declarative platform that that means that it automatically knows let's say the order of operational um elements that that are built so when we're thinking about let's say adding a subnet or a vpc think of all the you know emails and conversations and and just the steps involved to just add a VPC within one organization, because um, you're talking across groups and working with multiple teams. Um, but also when you build that VPC, you have to know, it has to know the order and what the process is. And, and Terraform knows that automatically, especially with the Aviatrix Terraform being an official provider, it actually reduces the number of steps 
let's say from, you know, like five or six down to one or two. So there are definitely advantages of not just, you know, Terraform, but that Aviatrix is now an official provider. It's, it made that even more simple. And so uh, not just that, uh, integrating with the CICD pipeline, that's a, that's a key requirement that we, we do in our lab today. And, and that's, that's what organizations are looking to try to build out and figure out. And that's, that's somewhat of an organizational conversation, but also it is a, um, a need that is something that we, we've built and live by every day in our own ATC lab. And, and finally, if you look at governance and compliance controls, you know, that's another benefit that this, this provides. Um, and the flexibility too, because we're going to actually always increase, enhance this lab and being able to literally destroy or remove a subnet, you know, with one command across this entire architecture is so efficient, such a smart way to do things that, you know, I'm just giving you some simple examples, but this has made um, our ability to deliver to multiple labs to our customers. And, and without that, that Terraform integration, I don't think we would be able to you do this now nearly as efficient or or to the scale that we, we can do today. So um, I'll kind of stop there and I'm gonna, I want to pass it over to Jake because Jake's going to talk uh, in depth about, you know, Terraform and I've touched on some of the benefits, but he's going to go a little deeper into what the what the platform's about and, and more, in, more in depth. So Jake, I'll uh, kind of hand it over to you. Okay, thanks, Eric. Uh, yeah, uh, cool. Let me uh, Let me share this out. Make sure I don't have anything uh, you know, sort of not safe for work on there, like a Christmas uh, shopping list or anything like that. So uh, happy holidays, everybody. Uh, welcome. I'm Jake Lundberg, uh, uh, solutions engineer here at HashiCorp. We're going to talk about Terraform today. Let me just put this into present mode. Hopefully, uh, y'all are still seeing that properly. Please ping me if you're not. And uh, cool. All right. So. Uh, first of all, uh, the, we're uh, part of the account team here and, uh, you know, kind of Southwest here. Um, Kurt Neerider is uh, the account manager out of, uh, out of Phoenix, and uh, I am Jake Lundberg, a regional manager uh, covering out of uh, Los Angeles area here. Uh, the, the code block here, uh, believe it or not, if, uh, <clears throat> if you do a Terraform up, you're not going to automatically create a Kurt or Jake out there. Luckily, it's item potent. We already exist, so uh, we'll get into a little bit of what that looks like here in just a second. So who are we? Uh, we're HashiCorp. <clears throat> we, uh, we produce a lot of tools. We're here to talk about Terraform today, but just kind of a, a brief overview about what it is that we do. Uh, Derek <clears throat> talked quite a bit about the complexities of, of going into cloud infrastructure. And so uh, the main focus for, uh, for HashiCorp is to really make that journey into the cloud a much smoother and easier process um, for everybody that's out there. And so uh, we typically think of ourselves as being broke up into four main verbs, and that's provisioning infrastructure, uh, securing infrastructure, uh, connecting infrastructure and your applications together, and then running your applications on any of that infrastructure that you've built. Uh, on the right-hand side, you can see all the, the products that uh, that we, we create. Some of these you may be familiar with. Um, some of you, you may not be. So uh, just a, a heads up, before I came to this company, I wasn't aware that we created all these things. Boundary and Waypoint are new. We just uh, we just released those back in October. Uh, we're, you know, we've been around for almost 10 years now, uh, rounding out at eight years. We're over a thousand employees and uh, we've got a bunch of people trying to throw money at us to uh, keep this thing going. So we're really excited about that. Whoops, I must have clicked an alarm right now. Okay, so what is Terraform even? Uh, I'm going to start off just kind of with um, the overall sort of themes that we see with our customers that are out there. So um, two main categories, really cloud compliance and management. That's a, you know, how do I get the things out into my cloud and how do I do it in a um, secure and uh, regular fashion? And then second bucket is really uh, in and around self-service infrastructure. So once you have your discipline uh, down about how you're going to uh, release that code into your environments, uh, then how do I uh, release that for uh, for the particular users? Some vanity metrics down here, uh, we'll cover the providers and, and whatnot later, but uh, we have a massive amount of customers, uh, especially on the enterprise side, but also on the open source side. And then uh, we just have a, a massive amount of downloads that are happening on a week to week basis. Um, so that's kind of the high level overview. Uh, what is it really in practice? Uh, Terraform is an infrastructure as code platform. Uh, probably uh, what I would consider to be the easiest that are out there. I've got a background in DevOps engineering. Um, I've used CloudFormation and, and ARM and a bunch of homegrown stuff. Uh, Terraform, when we brought Terraform into our environment, it really eased uh, our concept of that. And, and Derek touched on this a little bit. 
So the basic flow of the way things go for uh, for users with Terraform is um, you have somebody who uh, writes uh, some infrastructure as code objects. We'll see a code example of that aside from the uh, the uh, the people one out here in a second. Um, that then it usually gets checked into some kind of version control repository. It doesn't have to be if you're doing local development, but the vast majority of folks who use these tools are are integrating this with some kind of a version control system. And then uh, once you uh, sort of defined in that declarative uh, code base what your infrastructure should look by look like uh, there's a two-step um, sort of deployment mechanism the first is the plan and that's basically going to tell you uh, what what it is that terraform is going to do and like I said terraform is item potent and so it it goes out and looks at your infrastructure um, compares what it is that you have inside of your uh, your code manifest and then does and then basically creates or modifies anything that um, has changed within with the difference between what's actually been deployed and what actually exists out in the infrastructure and so uh, really uh, you know allows you to you know uh, set up a, um, a consistent code base you're basically just writing your infrastructure um, you know instructions what it is that you desire your infrastructure to look like and terraform will go out there and 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 paint those things that are out there um, so uh, the, uh, the, the beauty of Terraform isn't just the fact that it has a very simple mental model about, and um, item potency, it's really the flexibility of being able to integrate it with lots of other things that are out there. And so, so like a quick code example, it looks something like this. HDL is a configuration language. I'm uh, in this particular example, launching a Google Compute Instance as well as a DNS simple record. These are completely different uh, providers that are out there, but we're using a consistent language across all of these um, interfaces. And so uh, right away, this helps with uh, accelerating your ability to, um, to integrate lots of different technologies. So Aviatrix is a great example of this. Uh, you're able to launch Aviatrix um, based resources, but you're also able to launch the resources uh, that you need inside the cloud that you're going to integrate those with. And so uh, it, it sort of becomes the, um, the sort of lingua franca of, uh, of cloud or any kind of uh, delivered service uh, mechanisms that are out there. So uh, even even more importantly is that we have here so that 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 logo didn't uh, turn out too well, but um, we have a uh, a tremendous amount of providers, uh, 400 uh, over 400 of which right now. Uh, the main ones that most people are going to be concerned with um, generally is like any of the cloud providers, and that's what we're we're typically known for. But you know that we're having this webinar with Aviatrix is also testimony of the fact that now. Um, you can plug in any kind of uh, API driven uh, infrastructure related materials that are out there. So if you have, you know, ServiceNows or if you have GitLabs or um, if you have any kind of Jenkins or Okta uh, objects that you need to create on a regular basis, Terraform has the ability to do that. And so um, again, the, the workflow is the, is the most important thing that's out there. Really the language, the, the you know, the uh, resource differences. It's just really learning what the what the calls are for those things, and it's it's very trivial once you understand how to use Terraform to then layer in any other um, service uh, 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 components as well. Okay, so um, in, in terms of like cloud compliance and management, uh, we you know Derek talked through some of the business values that are out there. Obviously, reducing the risk by having um, reusable code that's been checked and sort of vetted by folks, um, being able to you know launch the same things over and over, and then being able to triage what the differences are between your code base and uh, and what's actually deployed that's out there. Uh, reducing costs is a, a couple different areas. One is um, you know being able to uh, you know create and destroy that infrastructure very easily. So so that uh, those components uh, that don't need to be uh, set laying around are, are laying around. One of the major things that most people get into when they um, get into the cloud is that their their cloud spend is very very high. So Terraform can help you, uh, you know, sort of reduce the amount of spend by being able to uh, both add and delete those resources exactly when you need them. And then increasing productivity. There's a couple different areas here. Uh, one is just the the workflow. Uh, we have lots of different providers that um, you can launch with one um, consolidated code base. And the other part of it too is that uh, you're starting to see uh, economies of scale where um, now you have lots of other folks that are out there um, that you can leverage within the Terraform community uh, that can help you out with uh, being able to produce the things that you need that are out there. And then uh, self-service infrastructure, really just the addition once you have your um, your your 
uh, your code base uh, sort of stabilized, it's very easy to then add that into say like an ITSM tool like ServiceNow or something like that. So people can literally just grab like a t-shirt uh, sized uh, vision of the of the operate or their uh, infrastructure and then uh, Terraform's underneath the cover kind of working on those things. And so um, it, again, increasing productivity just by uh, being able to uh, launch from a, a consolidated library. Um, if you're using some of the more um, enterprise versions of these, we have a product that's called Sentinel that can help to uh, create policy as code uh, so that you uh, it, you can actually verify that um, your business level policies are being met um, as well as your infrastructure plans. And then uh, increasing adoption really just around making it easy for folks um, to deploy that infrastructure. Okay, uh, just so, you know, in terms of the versions that we have out there, uh, it, very, very capable version of uh, the open source uh, capability. So um, you can download Terraform locally, start provisioning cloud infrastructure right now. Um, I, and the next level up is that Terraform Cloud sort of enables more advanced workflows uh, about being able to use like workspaces and um, and consolidated variable sets and security, uh, like uh, uh, vault back security inside of there. Um, so you can use both of those for free. Highly encourage folks to try out the cloud-based workflows. Again, they're free, so a very easy, uh, low barrier to entry there. And as we start to get into more um, complexity of, uh, of large organizations, um, adding in self, uh, self service and policy, and then uh, and then being able to uh, do localized operations, we start getting um, into uh, the Terraform Cloud uh, business tier, as well as self hosted versions of, of enterprise that we have out there. Okay, uh, you know, customer list that we have, uh, we've got a, a large amount of folks who use this. Uh, if you're if you're running any kind of uh, application that's that's running on the uh, on the web these days, very very likely that that infrastructure is being provisioned with Terraform. Okay, uh, just a little bit further, if uh, you're looking to get more information, uh, terraform.io, great, uh, great site to go to. If you wanna uh, try out the cloud-based operations, app.terraform.io is the entry point for that. And then last and certainly not least is learn.hashicorp.com. We have a very large amount of curated materials to help people get off the ground and then begin uh, provisioning infrastructure, such as your Aviatrix um, networking gear or any of the rest of the cloud um, stuff that we have there. Um, just again, uh, really quick, uh, we are uh, Kurt and Jake, uh, the account teams that are here. You can find us at these locations. And then that's all I had. I think um, we're, we're handing over to, uh, to Dana now or back to you, uh, Derek. Yeah, thanks, Derek. Or sorry, <laughs> yeah, thanks, Jake. That was fantastic. Let me hey, hey, Dana. Yeah. I was, I was going to add one comment because, uh, and just, real, just one second, because Jake, you, you pointed out the Terraform Cloud. I just want to mention our, our Aviatrix Lab. We actually leveraged Terraform Cloud in this example, and it real to mainly uh, number one to maintain our state. And because Terraform Cloud also has historical state, it really has helped us kind of manage and look at analyze our infrastructure changes over time. So I just want to mention that real quick and just just how how easy it has made us our, our and look at the historical analysis and maintaining our state is so important in, in Terraform. Yeah, Derek, that's a great point. And uh, the other part of it too is that um, for folks that are really driving towards automation, the Terraform Cloud um, also has a, a API hooks into it, and so it's very, very easy to then you know provision Terraform uh, Cloud with Terraform, or if you have existing like CI/CD workflows, um, you can control them very easily through that. Whereas a lot of times with the open source products, um, folks have to kind of build their own uh, runners and they have to uh, maintain their state, like you were saying. Um, so it makes it um, pretty it, for people who are really, really into automation. Terraform Cloud is a is a great option for you. So thanks for pointing that out. Great. Yeah. Thanks both of you. And actually in the demo I'm about to do, I use Terraform cloud as well. So, you know, a ton of my customers are using Terraform cloud. It's super powerful. So you get, you get to see a little sample of that here. Okay, great. So we're going to go into some, some of the weeds now I'm a little bit deeper and also provide a little bit of a demo here. Uh, just real quick. I'm Dana Yanch. I'm a senior systems engineer with Aviatrix and uh, I don't have a nice headshot, uh, professional headshot like Derek. So, I'm using my Tinder picture. You guys can <laughs> enjoy that. But uh, <laughs> if you like um, the content that I'm about to provide here, I have a ton of it on my YouTube channel, Dana at Aviatrix. Go check that out. Go subscribe. And you can pretty much educate yourself on the entire platform, including Terraform and uh, the Aviatrix networking platform end to end and uh, learn it all pretty quickly. So let's get started here. So if it's not painfully obvious as to why, Aviatrix and HashiCorp fit so well together. I'm going to go through it 
uh, real quick here. So both HashiCorp and Avatrix are really modern multi-cloud networking infrastructure companies, right? So we're both really focused on bringing infrastructure automation, uh, providing enterprise class functionality to the cloud. And you know, HashiCorp has become this de facto standard for multi-cloud automation. It's incredible where they started and where they are now. And pretty much anybody doing multi-cloud automation is leveraging HashiCorp, some component of HashiCorp's uh, solutions. It's, it's really amazing. And Avatrix definitely saw the power that HashiCorp provided. And you know, we took advantage of that. And then we built this really beautiful partnership. And so now Aviatrix is a, we're an official provider uh, with HashiCorp as well. And so it's uh, it really, it makes sense to bring both the uh, best of class automation from multi-cloud and then the best in class network infrastructure for multi-cloud together to get this you know, best of all world solutions, right? So what Aviatrix is doing, and I'll show you momentarily, is that we're providing uh, an abstraction of complexity. We're easing the operations in the cloud. We're building a normalized data plane across all clouds. We're making it really easy for organizations to insert advanced security mechanisms into the cloud. We're providing unparalleled visibility, things you've never seen before from a cloud visibility perspective. And we're, you know, we're focused on the abolishment, I guess you could say, of the black box model. We're all about the open enterprise class model. We wanna provide every bit of data you need to be effective as a network architect in the cloud, to be as a DevOps engineer in the cloud, or as a network operations engineer in the cloud. You need all those tools in your tool belt to be effective, and Aviatrix uh, is providing that in partnership uh, with, with HashiCorp here, okay? And you know, I kind of mentioned already, and actually Derek has talked a ton about this already, the challenges of multi-cloud and how it's being solved by, by Aviatrix. And you know, uh, it's, it's a true problem. I, John and I, John's my account manager, he's on this call as well. John and I talk to, I don't know, tons of customers every week, and all of them are multi-cloud, if not making provisions to move to multi-cloud. And that doesn't mean they're 50-50, you know, right? They might be doing 75, 25, and you know, 75% in AWS and 25% in Azure. Sometimes it's the opposite, right? The whole point is that you need to have multi-cloud optionality in your architecture. As you build out and invest in your cloud infrastructure, you need to keep thinking about how, uh, how can I uh, extend this investment across any cloud the moment that requirement comes down the pipeline from my business? Because it's the business that determines multi-cloud. It isn't the network architects. It usually isn't the apps or the network architects. It's the business that will determine this. And it just comes out of nowhere. And you need to be ready to, to handle that when it comes down, comes down the, the pipeline here. Okay, we also want to reduce the learning curve, right? So single cloud was difficult and you spend a lot of time learning all about one cloud, but it doesn't easily translate to all the other clouds out there. So AVH is providing this abstraction of complexity with an intelligent controller. With a lot of logic built into that controller to abstract that complexity, make it easier to deploy validated architecture, stamp them out over and over again across all your different regions and across your different clouds and do this in an automated fashion with, uh, with HashiCorp's uh, Terraform. Right? So we wanna promote a single API in the end. And lastly, Aviatrix is providing this centralized intelligence. Now, if you started in the, uh, the on-prem world, like most of us, most of us have, I'm sure uh, Derek and myself have had our, our uh, stints in, in, in on-prem for years. The last part of the last 15 years is what we've been doing is on-prem. And you know, on-prem networking is pretty intelligent. You have all sorts of dynamic routing protocols and automation functions, and now a lot of software-defined networking uh, in on-prem networking. And, and you know, then when you look at cloud networking, it's so rudimentary. It's very basic. It's dumb, right? And what I mean by dumb is that it's unintelligent. There's not a lot of intelligence there. It's up to the end user. It's up to the network engineer or network ops engineer to insert that intelligence and to figure it all out and to continually manipulate and do things very statically. And you know, at enterprise scale, enterprise class, that doesn't work. It's just unrealistic. And so we need to find this balance between intelligence and automation and enterprise class functionality. And Aviatrix has really found that. And you'll see here that we've just killed it in recent times, especially it's been exploding as cloud consumption has been exploding. So has Aviatrix because people have realized that this problem 
is universal. This problem of complexity, this problem of the lack of automation, lack of visibility, lack of, of enterprise class features is, is, is universal. It's a problem that is happening across all verticals, all customers, big and small. So you can see here, we've really, you have customers all over the place, like all around the world, every single vertical, every single type of, uh, of, of, of a solution out there. So it's a, a very universal problem that we're solving. And we got to talk a little bit about how do we solve it? So if you haven't heard of Aviatrix, or you haven't looked into the platform, I'm going to give you a little bit of a dive into it. It's not a deep dive, but you can get an understanding of how it plays out. And it's pretty straightforward. So Aviatrix has a centralized intelligent controller that is spun up in whatever VPC, VNet, VCN you want. And it's spun up by just grabbing it from the cloud source providers marketplace. So if you're doing AWS, it's the AWS marketplace, it could be Azure, GCP. We have them published there. And in 20 minutes via a CloudFormation or Terraform uh, template, it's spun up, you have access to the controller. The controller is spun up in one cloud, but it's uh, multilingual, it speaks all clouds. You don't need to spin up a different controller across all clouds. You spin up a set of HA controllers in one cloud, and then you onboard all your accounts and the subscriptions and projects across all your different CSPs into that single controller. And that controller acts as the control plane, an intelligent control plane brain for all of your clouds, but it also is your UI, you know, your uh, intuitive, robust UI. So if you want to do things via the UI first and learn about it all, you can do that. Uh, and it's also your target for your automation. So when you're building your Terraform scripting, your, your, your main.tf Terraform, and you, you need to point it towards, you know, what am I coding against? Well, you're coding against the controller and the controller's handling all the complexity uh, behind the scenes. Now, one thing I want to mention, when you build your Abatrix network with the controller, this is your network. It's up to you to manage, to, to control, to build, to architect. This isn't a SaaS, right? Or this isn't some uh, backbone that's being offered as a third party solution. No, you build this, you have all the flexibility and all the visibility and all the control of all the security mechanisms of how you build your architecture. It's really yours. I wanna make sure that's clear because this is an enterprise class solution. We don't subscribe to the black box as a service model because you don't get the flexibility as an enterprise class or an enterprise uh, uh, organization when you go down that path. We want you to have full control, but we wanna make sure we're not adding complexity. So we simplify, but we don't, and we add functionality, but we don't add any complexity. That's the balance, that beautiful balance that Aviatrix has found over the years, okay? So that controller is injected with six plus years of logic. This is, we're on our sixth, we're almost going to our seventh soon in the next year, major release of code. And that means, you know, we have tons of functionality that's been baked into this controller, tons of intelligence. We've solved problems for all sorts of customers, every type of problem you can imagine. And that's been now injected and baked into the controller that you can now leverage as well for your organization. Okay, so the controller, as I mentioned, control plane, but there's gotta be a data plane, right? We build a normalized data plane across all your cloud service providers so you can get that that uh, synchronization of parity and functionality across all clouds. You can have the same features, enterprise class visibility across all clouds. And we can simplify the implementation of networking infrastructure across all clouds using a normalized data plane. And that's what these guys are here, the Aviatrix gateways. The controller spins these gateways up selectively, strategically, based on the workflow you're deploying, whether it's a Terraform workflow or a UI-based workflow, it will spin them up for you, spin them down, it'll make them HA for you, it'll attract traffic from your VPCs and VNets, from your apps into the data, the data plane, the Aviatrix overlay, and then you get all the benefits of the advanced enterprise networking that Aviatrix can provide, okay? Now that controller is doing all that spinning up and spinning down of the gateways via an API, but also it can speak the API of the native constructs, the native uh, solutions. So for example, if a security group needs to be edited or if a network ACL needs to be edited or maybe a uh, route table needs to be edited with a new route or uh, updated with a new route because a path disappeared and a new path needs to be inserted, or maybe you need a load balancer spun up, the controller handles all of that as well for you because it understands the native constructs. 
Now, if you need to spin up third party solutions, especially security functions, we, we also speak the APIs of those functions as well. So for Net Checkpoint Palo Alto, we have turnkey solutions so that it's as simple as a couple clicks, a couple drop down boxes, and then you can spin up your security functions in the cloud at cloud scale and based on a policy, insert those firewalls or load balancers or SSL encryption solutions, whatever you're trying to leverage in the cloud into the path of traffic dynamically. We'll handle the whole life cycle of that. All right, lastly, Aviatrix has an analytics platform. It's just another instance that sits next to the controller and ingests data from the, uh, from the controller itself, from the gateways, from the cloud native solutions and provides you easily digestible outputs uh, in an analytics platform, whether that's a dashboard for health of the network across all your clouds, maybe the throughput of, of, of traffic going across all your clouds is provided there, or uh, a dynamic topology, which is incredible because as you build out, you construct and deconstruct your cloud, it's pretty dynamic, right? So you need a way to see what's the current state of my network. Aviatrix's Copilot is constantly collecting that and building out a dynamic topology that you can manipulate and save and, and modify. Uh, and it shows you exactly how everything's connected and how the traffic flows occur. And then lastly is, is the NetFlow V9 functionality of Copilot. Because you have a data plane now that you own, the gateways that you own, it can now extract the details of all the traffic going in and out of your clouds to on-prem to partners and then send that to Copilot via NetFlow V9 and then Copilot does its number crunching, provides you all sorts of nice analytics based off that data. Okay, so here's a little bit of a journey that our customers go on when deploying uh, Aviatrix. So really it's a simple, in 20 minutes you spin up the controller in whatever cloud you want. In five minutes you've onboarded your uh, uh, accounts or subscriptions or projects, and then you're off to the races. First thing most people do, they build out a multi-cloud transit, a multi-cloud capable transit is what I should say. That might be an AWS, it could be an Azure. So you build it out once in one region, you stamp it out again in another region, those talk to each other via high throughput, high performance encrypted uh, full mesh architecture, and then you can extend that to any other cloud you want. Right? This connectivity can occur over private connections, maybe through Equinix or Direct Connex or Express routes. It can happen over the internet, over the cloud service providers, internet backbone. It's up to you and how you want to build this out. It's pretty straightforward. Once you've built this infrastructure out, this mesh of multi-cloud network connectivity, you then can then leverage all the other functions that Aviatrix provides like network segmentation, multi-cloud network segmentation. We're all familiar with what VRFs are. Right? So we, now we can extend that same functionality from on-prem into the cloud and leverage segmentation across clouds no matter what cloud you're in. You don't have to figure out how do I segment this cloud from that cloud or this VPC from that VPC. They all use different functions across clouds. No, you just use the Aviatrix unified segmentation model and it provides that functionality. Same thing for insertion of service chaining. So if you want to insert firewalls or load balancers or SSL decryption solutions or SD-WAN, so we have a function that can automate and insert that into the path of traffic dynamically as well. All those network, uh, those network flows, those, those different functions have been thought through and we've played with them and we've had them implemented with customers for some time now. Okay, and lastly, as you build this out, you get all that network visibility naturally, right? Because everything is bypassing or sort of bypassing is actually going into the Aviatrix data plane so we can then extract and extrapolate and get you more information through Aviatrix Copilot. Now there's a ton of stuff in here. I can't go into depth here with the amount of time that we have. I have videos on this. If you wanna go check it out on my YouTube channel, I go into uh, depth of every single one of these functions and, and uh, features you can go into. But one thing I wanna mention is that just because you're leveraging this normalized data plane and control plane through Aviatrix doesn't mean that you lose anything from your native constructs, your native features. You still can use Lambda, you can still use, use S3, you can still use TGW, you can still use all these things that you used to using before, uh, and, and they're, they're still available, right? We have functions and, and automations built in to, to leverage that, those native constructs. Now I'm just showing you what you see in AWS, but that's actually supported across uh, all clouds, right? Now, when you leverage the AVHS data plane, you get all this advanced networking functionality, right? You get the traffic engineering capability that you didn't have uh, from your service providers, right? You get the BGP intelligence, you get best path selection algorithms that you can manipulate, 
but, and then you can do advanced things like uh, IP NAT, right? So NATing, source NAT, destination NAT, advanced NAT functions that just were very difficult or not possible in CSPs uh, today. Okay. So here's a piece that uh, I think uh, is going to resonate with a lot of people on this call if they came here to learn more about automation with HashiCorp uh, and Aviatrix. So this, this breaks it down, right? So Aviatrix is a top level provider, an official provider. So you build all your code against the Aviatrix provider, and then we'll handle the complexity behind the scenes to deploy everything. So whether that's to configure native constructs or Aviatrix services or the networking infrastructure or security infrastructure, we handle it all. So now you're, you have a unified API. It's a simplistic way to deploy uh, with automation. You don't have to figure out how to use all sorts of different modules and resources and time all together. Now for your infrastructure in the cloud, just use Aviatrix and then we'll figure out the complexity behind the scenes for you. Now, if you don't know anything about HashiCorp uh, Terraform and you've never played with it before, like myself when I joined Aviatrix, I actually, what I started doing was building everything via the UI and then we have a function to export the code as, it's, as you built it in the UI to uh, to Terraform. So it makes it easy to figure out how to, how to do the conversion. Okay. And so it's as simple as going to the, the section of the UI and exporting the functions that you had already deployed and it gives you the Terraform code. Now I don't have time to go into demonstrating the day two operations of Aviatrix, but this is just an incredible function in our platform. And I really want to recommend you go watch my videos on uh, Copilot. Copilot, or actually we just had a new one by the developer of Copilot within uh, our organization, which just posted on the Aviatrix YouTube channel. Go check that out. It'll really blow your mind, I guarantee it. All right, so let's jump to the demo here. Before I go to the demo, I want to show you what we're going to be building out. So hopefully you can see that. I think you can see that screen. Yep. If not, somebody yell out. But you should be able to see a diagram here. What we're going to build out via Terraform is this transit network in the EU West one region of AWS, and then a transit in the EU West two region of AWS. This is going to be a high, highly available transit architecture from Aviatrix, our data plane, as well as insert firewalls in each one of these transit networks, and then connect the two transits together. This is all going to be done via Terraform and the Terraform cloud, and it'll be done you know, pretty quickly. So let me, uh, let me get that going here. There we go. So I'm gonna narrate this as we go through. And now it's been sped up, of course, right? Because I don't want you guys to sit through and uh, watch me uh, watch a code run. But you can see here, here's the basic code. And I'm using modules. Modules are an abstraction of the actual uh, Terraform code behind the scenes. And so modules are published by Aviatrix. We build all sorts of modules. And so you can say, for example, a, a transit module. Within the transit module, it's it's um, simplifying all the other functions within it. Like if it's, if it's HA and what type of, ter what type of mod, uh, a transit it is, if firewalls are included or not. And so I'm building this, these two transits using two modules and I'll show you the Terraform code behind it. And then you can see I'm connecting the two uh, transits together. All right, so I'm gonna skip through this real quick. You can see I'm highlighting the modules and how simple they are. It's just, there's a couple of variables you throw in there like the cider of the, of the VPC we're gonna build out the type of firewall image we want to use and what connects to what, all right? So it's as simple as that. Now you can see here, I also have some, a variable file and that variable file is just for this main.tf. So I can specify, you know, what's happening behind uh, for those Terraform uh, variables. But actually I'm gonna use Terraform Cloud to specify them, all the other variables. Uh, so you can see here, this is the actual code behind the scenes. The module is calling on this code. Now, I don't have to really edit anything here because there's a bunch of defaults. So I don't have to worry too much about that. And if you want to learn more about every single uh, variable and value uh, and function in the code, you could go to the Aviatrix or the Terraform official provider documentation and it explains all that in detail. All right, so here's Terraform Cloud. I've already, I already have the, the code uploaded. I have everything set up. All I'm going to do is run the script that you saw earlier. I'm just going to queue the plan, deploy it. OK, 
Okay, it's, what it's going to do first is check to make sure that everything is in place, all my variables are, are specified, that the, the, the syntax is correct, everything is great, and it'll give you an output, output to tell you what's being built. Well, I'm building 11 resources, you can see here. There's 11 things that it's going to be building out. You can go back and see really what it's going to build out if you want. So I'm going to confirm and apply this. All right, so it's running. Now you can see this is sped up. In the real world, this took about 10 minutes. Uh, in this demo, it's like about 15, 20 seconds or so. Okay, so it's pretty much done. Yeah, we need a, we need a turbo option in there, right? So yeah. <laughs> if we could only do this on all infrastructure. <laughs> I know, right? And I bet you could, it's actually the, a, the AWS and, and the uh, Azure uh, backends that are a little bit slow to do stuff, <laughs> believe it or not. Um, so it's built out, it's done. It's, it's, it's basically, I built out this environment in 10 minutes of, of pushing a code. Now, if you were to do that manually via the UI, eh, it probably would have took you 45 minutes, if you're good, if you're used to navigating the UI, right? To, to go, going from maybe an hour to 45 minutes down to 10 minutes, that's a massive, that's a massive difference, especially if you do this at scale, right? So think about that. Now, if you were to do this manually without any intelligence, you know, click in the console and do everything yourself. You know, you're spending hours or days building this out yourself. This is just awesome to be able to do this so quickly. So you can see now that I built it out, I go to the controller UI and you can see, okay, yeah, I did build it out and you can just validate that. And here are the, the four transit gateways, those two data plane gateways that got built out. It's two in each region. You can see what siders were selected and, and, uh, uh, this is just some more information about that. Now we can also see that they were peered together. I didn't do this manually. The, the, the code did it, right? So now I've got a high throughput mesh between the two transit networks. What about the firewalls? Were they deployed? Yes, they were deployed. If we scroll down to the firewall section, you can see I've deployed four firewalls, two in each transit in each region. These are Fortinet firewalls. It, you know, you can even push code to the firewalls. You can push bootstrap to the firewalls via this whole automation mechanism so that they come up already configured. Now, I didn't do that in this demo, but at least it gives you access to those firewalls immediately to jump into them and to configure them and to upload your config. Right? Very straightforward. This was done in 10 minutes. If you were to manually deploy all this stuff, just imagine how long it takes. And you can also deconstruct all this in minutes, right? You can go back to the Terraform uh, cloud and you can just deconstruct, you destroy. You want to destroy it, and in, in minutes, all this is, is removed from your network. Okay. And also, you can see that I have enabled uh, the internet egress, so traffic is going to egress out to the internet via this firewall. So you can see egress is, is enabled. All that propagation of routing is configured for you end-to-end -end within your cloud. Nothing had to be configured manually. All right? Great. Let's go back to my slide deck here. If I can exit this thing. There we go. Okay. So I know there's a lot of information in a short period of time. I hope we got some good Q and A. I didn't get a chance to look at it. Um, but so if there were any Q and A, uh, my counterparts here would probably answer them. So if you want to learn more about Aviatrix and just do some self-paced training, we have Aviatrix certified engineer training. Okay. So you can go through and, and uh, learn all the stuff on your own. It's self-paced. And instructor led, you get to hear us talk for another four hours, and then you can take an exam after and get your ACE certification. This is just like I think 30 plus thousand people now have signed up for this, and I think we're nearing 10,000 certified individuals, and it's exploding. So go take some time to learn on your own, or you can go check out the uh, YouTube channel as well and, and learn a lot of resources there. Uh, we're just just constantly uploading new new resources as this platform also keeps changing, gets better and better. Okay. There's also a survey that I believe uh, Katie is going to throw into the chat. Yep, there it is. Go do that survey. We really appreciate knowing uh, what your thoughts are on all this and if it's valuable to you and we can adjust it as necessary. Okay. That's the end of my section. I want to thank you. So Dana, I don't know if you guys can, uh, can still hear me. My, my connection got kind of goofy. I didn't hear you explicitly call it out. And one thing I wanted to make sure we mentioned for the audience before we let them go 
I mean, in addition to all the normalization of the nomenclature and, and sort of handling or abstracting the disparities between the, the native constructs of AWS and Azure and GCP, for example, that one real eye opener for me was on third on third party service insertion. So looking at Palo Alto as an example for security, there's also some real performance implications and just fundamental design flaws with how the cloud providers have, it, have architected or engineered their their connectivity so that if you insert those third party services, you're often doing so with like performance implications or an inability to deploy true HA. And you guys solve for all of that. So I, I think a big one that I didn't hear you explicitly mention was that concept that by normalizing and abstracting the way you do with Aviatrix, you also now make it so that you can fully leverage like full capabilities, no weird design caveats underneath, you know, and get full performance and capability out of those uh, third-party services like Palo Alto firewalls and cloud. Yes, absolutely, Kevin. Uh, that's an awesome, awesome uh, addition there. Uh, the whole point of Aviatrix in our organization is to augment, right? Is to add functionality without adding complexity. And, you know, that's a good point. You know, a lot of the, the traditional ways of inserting, for example, firewalls into the path of traffic uh, using native constructs manually, is really inefficient. It's a ton of uh, downsides on the way it's done in the way it's been pre presented in the last, you know, four or five years. Aviatrix has solved all of that and it, from the perspective of visibility and performance and scale out. And so if you want to learn more about that, that's called FireNet. Uh, and then you can go just Google that as a million uh, pieces of resources to learn about that and how you can make your implementation more enterprise class there. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you to all of the presenters. You guys did a fantastic job today. Everyone is so much smarter because of you. So we thank you. Everyone that, that signed up for this webinar will be getting a, a, a copy of the recording and possibly some other information as a follow-up. Uh, so just be looking for that. And uh, if there's nothing else from anyone, then I just want to wish everyone a, a great day. Hey, Mike. Yeah, thanks for doing this. And by the way, Dana, I really like the fact that you all built your own exporter into there. We, we get so many questions about that. So what, nice job, uh, you know, sort of accelerating people's ease of use on that. Sure, and, uh, absolutely. I love it. That's how I learned it. And I'm still not an expert, but I'm learning that way. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a great tool set. Uh, Mike, yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for coordinating all this. This is, this is awesome. And uh, look forward to working with uh, the folks over at Avery. Do you have a bit more? Good deal. Excellent. Have a good day, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.